So Tim, if you're ready for the recording. Okay, great. So I am thrilled to introduce two people today who are gonna be given the, the Friday seminar. So this is a, a new one for us. We've, uh, in, in, in order, I'll, I'll introduce Marcy Carlson and then Peter Fallison. Marcy joining us from Wisconsin, Peter from Italy. So uh, this is really a, a pretty special thing for us uh, to be able to do. And it was their idea to, to do it, to set it up this way. So I'm really thrilled about that. So Marcy Carlson um, earned her PhD from the University of Michigan in 1999 um, and postdoc with Sarah McClanahan at Princeton in the Office of Population Research, and then was an assistant and associate professor at Columbia uh, from 2001 to 08, and then moved to Wisconsin-Madison in 20, uh, 2008, where she has worked ever since. Marcy is currently professor of sociology uh, at Wisconsin and served as director of their Center for Demography and Ecology, the, the equivalent of CPC, at, uh, from 2016 to 2021, so just coming off of that directorship. Uh, earlier, she served as CD's associate director for training. Marcy is a family demographer, and her primary research interests center on the associations between family contexts and the well-being of parents and children. And her recent work has focused on aspects of family change, especially non-marital childbearing linked to growing family com complexity and inequality in the United States. Among many other accomplishments in Marcy's career to date, and there are many, uh, NIH grants, NSF grants, study sections, publications, and, and more, uh, I want to mention too, she recently secured a grant from NICHD with Kelly Music at Cornell to develop a national program for training in the population sciences for underrepresented undergraduate students, a program that I think is sorely needed and will draw substantial attention and will begin in the summer of 2022. So for the field as a whole, that's, that's um, we thank you for that. Uh, Marcy is also currently serving as vice president of PA and as current president, I've greatly enjoyed working with her. Um, it's been really fun to, to, to do so over the last year. So I admire her ideas, tenacity, and heartfelt commitment to the greater good. And moreover, I mean, I, I think Marcy may be the nicest, most positive energy person I've ever met in our discipline. Um, Peter Fallison earned his PhD in sociology from the University of Copenhagen in 2015 and is currently a research professor at the Rockwell Foundation in Copenhagen an associate professor of sociology at the Swedish Institute for Social Research at Stockholm University, and a research affiliate at the Center for Demography and Ecology at, at uh, UW-Madison. During the fall semester this year, he's also a visiting fellow at the Department of Political and Social Sciences at the Euro European, University, European University Institute in Florence, Italy. I say, needless to say, uh, Peter is living a pretty good life right now. Uh, his research focuses on family demography, social inequality, child welfare, mental health, criminal justice, and applied uh, econom uh, econometrics. He's also earned a number of prestigious grants in his early career to date, and his research has appeared in leading journals, including Demography, Journal of Marriage and Family, Journal of Health and Social Behavior, and more. So it's a pure joy today to be able to have both Marcy and Peter visit with us and talk about their collaborative work with the title, Longer Lives, Later Births, General Generational Overlap in Denmark and the United States. Uh, please take it away, Marcy and Peter. Great, thank you so much, Bob, for that incredibly gracious introduction. I really appreciate it. I'm so honored to be here today. And it's been just such a delight to work with you this past year as PAA uh, Vice President while you've been president. So huge thanks and gratitude uh, to you. Um, so let me share my screen here. Let me get this going. Did that come up okay? Everyone see it? Okay, great. Um, so it's really a delight to be here. It's pretty new. In fact, we have, uh, oops, the Zoom quit unexpectedly. Um, uh, this week at NIH, and I've been scared to look at the scores, so uh, we'll see how that goes, but we're basically trying to do some new work related to um, generational overlap. Um, is my screen okay? I'm getting messages that there's an error in Zoom. So, okay. Um, great. So this is brand new work um, that we're just kind of moving along here, and Paula Fonby at the University of Michigan is also a co-author and um, really an integral part of this project. Um, so let me give you some background here. Um, so this audience probably needs um, not a lot of introduction in terms of demographic trends and what's going on, but let me just give you some kind of big picture points so we make sure we're on the same page. So we'll talk about that, then we'll talk about why we might care about generational overlap, 
Um, we'll talk about why Denmark and the United States might be a useful comparison. Um, Peter will talk about uh, results so far for Denmark. So sorry, we don't today yet have the US comparison, but that's where we're going next. And then we'll think about some kind of implications and next steps of this project. So in terms of major demographic trends, um, a lot's happened, right, in terms of demography, um, sometimes called the second demographic transition in terms of the family pieces, um, the fertility and, and unit formation things, but there have been, births have been happening much later, right, than they were before, and especially among those with higher um, education or higher socioeconomic status. We've also seen a major um, extension of a life expectancy. Um, people are living generally longer, longer, healthier lives, and so we have longer lives and we have births um, often happening later. Um, and these combined forces change the extent to which life courses um, could overlap across generations. And there might be important differences by socioeconomic status, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So if you look uh, here, sorry, I'm just going to make this a little smaller. Um, RC, oh, sorry, sorry to, but your screen doesn't seem to be advancing. The, the slides. Is it not going? No, so maybe stop sharing for a minute and restart. Sorry, it's going on this end. Okay, screen share. Is it going now? It's not coming up yet. There it is. Okay, so it's now it's on the title screen. Okay, and there did it move? No. Otherwise, I can I can share the slides with me, Marcy, if that's easier. Did we just lose Marcy? Oh boy, uh, <laughs> Peter. Yep. Okay. Uh, can you see the screen? No. So maybe if Peter wants to share, right. is that okay? Will that work? Yeah, well, that work. I don't know what's going on with my. Mazi, I'll, 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 I'll share the screen and you'll just hit me to, uh, to advance the slides. Okay. Apologies for this. Is this working? Yeah, I think so. Good. Um... Okay, so, great. So can you, <laughs> can you see the screen and can you still hear me? <laughs> Yes, yes. Sorry, I think we need to get our internet checked here. Um, so anyway, so I think I was on the next slide, Peter. Uh, and the next one after that. So um, there's been a delay in fertility, right? So the age at which people are having births. So if you go to Peter, click one more slide. Um, you can see here uh, Denmark and the United States with the US on the left. Um, the blue bar is the most recent 2017 number. And then you can see the black dot and the white dot. And so in general, across OECD countries, the average age that people are having, women are having births has gone up. And so you can see here for Denmark, it's a little over, it's around 30. Um, for the US, it's about 28, um, but generally increasing timing of births. And next slide. Um, you can see here that they've shifted, the, the profile has shifted over toward the right, right, in terms of um, there's still, at least in the U.S., some folks are having births at relatively younger ages, but in general, the whole distribution has shifted over to the right. Um, next slide. Um, in terms of life expectancy, you can see here that in general, um, the lines have gone up in terms of, this is OECD data from 2017. So people living longer, right? And a lot of folks um, find that to be a quite well-known fact, right? But it's um, Denmark and the US have similar life expectancies around 79 to 81 uh, years of age. Next slide. So in terms of generational overlap, um, we can think then about shared lifetimes across generations are really a function of fertility, right, of age at birth and mortality of life expectancy. And so we can then think about, okay, well, who's born at a given time, who's alive at that time. And obviously when you share your lifetime with someone that matters for relationships, identities, roles and resource transfers, right? So the extent to which your lives are linked living at the same time is going to affect 
affect a lot of different things. And we're especially interested in grandparent and grandchild relationships um, because we expect those to be generally, typically uh, mutually beneficial. Um, and so we know about, I, I would say we know quite, not very much about these basic patterns of generational overlap um, over time and across groups, right? And especially thinking about generation one being grandparents and generation three uh, grandchildren. Next slide. So there's quite a, a socioeconomic gradient in a lot of different demographic uh, factors. And here I'll just show you an example from Denmark, a socioeconomic gradient in life expectancy at age 30. And so you can see men on the left, women on the right, um, and those with higher education are likely to live longer, not surprisingly for those of you who do work in this area, right? So those with the highest education quartile are likely to live more than 50 years from age 30 compared to those who are at the lower end about age 40. 45 for men. Um, similar uh, trend on the right for women, although the levels are a little bit higher. Um, you can also see, next slide, there's a gradient in fertility, right? And so here's an example from the United States that's showing uh, the age at birth of first child by educational attainment. So those with a master's degree on average have children at around age 30. Um, those with a high school degree or less have kids around age 24. So quite a gap in when people experience this major transition of parenthood. Next slide. Um, so at the intersection of these, right, because both fertility and mortality vary by socioeconomic status, um, you have higher socioeconomic status folks having later births and longer life expectancy, and you have low SES people having earlier births and shorter life expectancy. Um, and so this likely then means that generational overlap also varies a lot by socioeconomic status. So the question of kind of who gets more in terms of time and quality of time, I think is not yet understood. Um, and so we're interested in the differences in grandparent grandchild shared lifetimes. Um, and eventually we hope to look at grandparent health and resources and a whole bunch of other kind of inputs into um, to grandchildren. So in this project, um, we're looking at generational overlap comparing Denmark and the US. Um, they, they have broadly similar demographic patterns, as I've shown you, at least in broad terms, um, but very different policy and inequality contexts. And so what we're interested to do in the broader project is describe the prevalence and length of generational overlap, uh, which is what you're hearing about today, for grandparents and grandchildren, including differences by SES, um, then evaluating the role of educational expansion in shifting generational overlap especially the, the um, situation of within family intergenerational mobility. So if you have um, uh, parents who have low socioeconomic status and are likely to not live very long, and then you have the next generation that is upwardly mobile and has higher education and therefore has fertility later, you might have this special case of kind of a crunch of shared lifetime with the sort of lower um, life expectancy on the grandparent side and then Low, later births for the middle generation. So we're interested in what, what does it mean with the broader context of educational um, expansion that's happened in many industrialized countries. Um, and then we wanna look at the potential SES gradient in the resources of grandparents that are available to children across a variety of um, different outcomes. So here you can see um, some comparisons between Denmark and the United States. So if you just look at um, the Gini in terms of market income or what people get from the labor market, you can see that the US and Denmark are not that different. So Denmark is about 0.45, the United States is about 0.51. So the US is a little bit more uh, unequal, but not dramatically so. And where that the, the big change happens is then when you get to disposable income, which includes taxes and transfers. So Denmark reduces their Gini from 0.45 to 0.26. The US not very much, right, down to about 0.39. And these numbers are from a couple of years ago. Obviously, a lot of things have changed in recent years, um, including public policy, right, which might make a big difference. But these are um, the data we have from kind of uh, pre-pandemic. And so if you just look at the poverty rate, thinking about the lower end, um, the market income poverty rate, right, if you just look at who is poor, and this is using the typical cross-national definition of less than half of the median income, you find that it's about 25% in Denmark, about 27% in the U.S., not dramatically different, right, the U.S. is a little bit higher, um, but after we apply taxes and transfers, you get to about 6% in Denmark and about 18% in the United States. So that's really where you see these big differences, right? So it's not that the sort of starting economy is dramatically different. 
different, but policy does different things in different countries. And the gap is even greater when you look at the child poverty rate, about 4% in Denmark compared to 21% in the United States. And so another way to look at it is comparing the distribution, looking at the 90th to the 10th percentile. In Denmark, the ratio is about three. In the US, it's about six. And then another thing, important factor, right, which is undergirding all of this is the spending that's happening. And so in, the, in Denmark, about 28% of GDP is spent for public social spending compared to about 19% for the US. And then if you just look at the subcategory of family benefits, um, it's about 3% for Denmark compared to 0.64 for the United States. And you can see in the next slide the, um, the levels that OECD um, countries or OECD averages in the orange bar. Um, it's about 20% of GDP and Denmark is over toward the left, one of the highest spending countries and the US is a little bit less than the average. So differences in terms of how countries are allocating resources in terms of the social welfare state and offsetting um, disadvantage. And this is just showing the trend in the family benefit public spending level. So the percent of GDP to that subset of benefits for families. And you can see that Denmark is, so this is, this is all the OECD countries and I've highlighted Denmark and the US. You can see that the US is toward the bottom end, Denmark toward the top. And if anything, that gap is increasing over time. So bottom line, sort of similar demographics, but different policies um, undergirding uh, social life and economic life. And the reason why these policy factors might matter is that, well, you could think of a lot of different things, right? But there's some reasons you would expect family supports to affect um, fertility, right? Because if you have parental leave and childcare and so forth, there's more great, there's more flexibility in the timing and quantum of fertility that you can have, right? You have to maybe you don't have to wait until you kind of got a sufficient income. You can say, oh, there's there's support, there's leave, there's care, and so forth in terms of when you might have children. And this we might expect would lead to a lower socioeconomic gradient in the timing of childbearing. Um, another example is health insurance, right? So if you have guaranteed um, and excellent um, health insurance and health care, this probably contributes to increased life expectancy and improved health and would likely reduce the socioeconomic gradient in life expectancy and health. And so as I've shown, there's more generous social support in Denmark, which we think might make these things play out somewhat differently. And just as a sidelight, um, part of our project, we're also going to compare Denmark and Wisconsin, where I am now. Um, the population is very similar, about 5.8 or 9 million, um, and similar um, background in terms of in Denmark, the percent of Danish origin non-immigrants, which are you know, white, it's about 86% in Wisconsin. It's a very um, white state, so about 85%. So we're hoping to do some comparisons of these two places with using the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study and the Danish population data. So in this paper, we're talking about generational overlap um, and at this point in Denmark. And so we're interested in what is the overlap in grandparent and grandchild lives over time? And then how does this overlap vary by socioeconomic status, which we're measuring by education? And then how does, we've got a preliminary glimpse at how does socioeconomic status or educational ability affect this overlap? And so that's what we're gonna get to some Danish results in just a few minutes. And so our expectations, all else equal, right, would be that later age at birth means less time for grandparents and grandchildren, their lives to overlap, right? Because if you wait, start longer having kids, that kind of shortens the time then that you might expect that overlap because grandparents are going to be older. On the other hand, longer life expectancy means more time, right? Because grandparents are living longer, there's going to be more time to overlap with the grandchildren. But it's obviously a function of kind of when all of these things begin. And then the socioeconomic differences are somewhat uncertain because of these countervailing forces, right? So higher education, longer lives, but later birth. So at the end of the day, how does it play out? And this is just a heuristic of overlapping life courses. And if you look at the three generations, um, you can see here we're focused on G1, the grandparent generation, and G3, the child. And so obviously the amount of overlap, which you can see in the sort of turquoisey blue color at the bottom, is a function of when did the parent have when did the grandparent have the parent? When did the parent have the grandchild? And then how long did the grandparent live after they had their child and after, more importantly, after the grandchild was born, right? And so you can see that that blue line represents the amount of shared time, but you can imagine that these are shifting as a function of when the birth happens, right? And then when the death happens. And so trying to think about like the shared time on the earth and what does that look like? And then think about what does that mean? 
And so there's a ton of related prior research. So um, I'm just going to give you some highlights here. And many of you have done a lot of related research um, on some pieces of this. And so population aging, life expectancy, and mortality, right? There's just a ton of work on this, including by Bob and co-authors, um, thinking about kind of what's happening at the later end of life. And then people have thought about what does this mean, population aging? What does that mean for individuals, for society? There's just, there's a I could have slides and slides on that kind of really big body of work. Um, there's also work thinking about the life course, right? And thinking one of my favorite um, papers actually that I read in graduate school was by Kahn and Antonucci about convoys of social support and kind of who's walking through with you or who's with you in different points of life that you're sharing that with, right? Or you could think about um, Glenn Elder's work, right? About linked lives. You could think about other work about the ecology of the families, right? And people set in context where what happens for one individual affects others individual as part of the broader kinship network. Um, and there's a lot of work on intergenerational processes and roles. How much time are you in family roles? Do you have multi-generational ties and kinship? Um, transfers between generation, right? Generations is a huge piece of trying to understand, you know, parent, adult, children, relationships and dynamics. There's an exciting new work on the demography of grandparents, how grandparents affect grandchildren. Um, there's new work on multi-generational households. Um, and there's um, also something that probably the most direct relationship to our particular topic is a paper by Song and Mare on shared lifetimes and educational mobility, where they use kind of aggregate level um, data to think about kind of what this means. And so there's a lot of related literatures that we would argue, and um, hopefully we're not missing something completely obvious, um, that there's been less on generation length and generational overlap. And yet this intersects with many key demographic constructs of interest, fertility, mortality, morbidity, age, period, cohort, inequality, life course, the list could go on. And we think that this has a major effect on the rate of population growth and decline, um, as well as the quality of life for those in a given population, right? Who is alive with you affects a lot of different things about how you see yourself, the roles, identities, responsibilities, relationships, resource transfers, um, and all of that then might affect inheritance, which happens after someone dies, but the time you share with them on the birth and the, the ties that you have are going to affect even that transfer that happens after death. So we think this is something that might be important um, within the, in the literature. Next slide. So this is where I think I switched to Peter, um, who's going to tell you about these amazing Danish uh, administrative data that I'm very lucky to have be able to work with him uh, to understand. So Peter, take it away. Thank you all very much, Marcy. Um, yes, so the data we're using for the project so far, because we're still getting, so, getting the US data sorted out, is basically full population data on, on, on the country of Denmark. And I'm guessing most demographers have heard about the Nordic registry data um, for years. But uh, for those of you who don't know it, I'm just gonna give you a very short introduction to them. So I normally start by saying that we're basically a country envisioned by George Orwell in the sense that we know everything about everyone. So at birth, you are assigned a social security number, and that number is used in all interactions you have with all government official institutions. That is schools, hospitals, your GP, the library, criminal justice, child welfare, and so on. What we're mainly going to be focusing on is data that is from the birth registers that allow us to link parents to children, and thereby also to grandchildren. And then data from the educational uh, and medical registries that allow us to look at people's educational attainment, as well as getting some, some um, rather rough, but still quite good health measures. So the sample we're gonna be looking at is gonna be all children born in Denmark from 1990 until 2018 at the moment. We'll hopefully update that soon to parents who are themselves born in Denmark. So we're, we're allowing for grandparents to be immigrants, but parents have to be born in the country. And that's because otherwise we might not see them in the data. But in total, this gives us at the moment a bit more than 1.60 million births through the period. We link these, these, uh, these generations through this medical birth registry that allow, uh, that gives us these um, unique identification numbers uh, that everyone is born with. And we have 
basically close to complete three generational linkage for all parents born since 1956. And that allow again for nearly complete linkage from grandparent to grandchild from 1990 and onwards. And of course, there might there is some individuals in the data that is missing one of one of one of their parents, often it's gonna be their father. But actually that number is quite low. So we're down to outside people who are getting having children on their own through some type of ART treatment. We are talking less than 1% of the data where we don't have both parents in the data. Uh, further, we have full population mortality records from, uh, from 1974 and onwards, and that covers date of death for all deaths since then. And in, in terms of educational attainment, we have all, um, all obtained education that, that's been registered since 1981 and onwards. And we can link this directly both to birth and, and birth records. So we can calculate people's uh, highest educational attainment and we just code this in a very standard ISCAT scheme where we have um, kind of primary and, and lower secondary coded together, then upper secondary, so that would be high school for itself and then beyond upper secondary, so all types of, of college. And last, we are also linking this data set to hospital records that allows us access to full inpatient hospitalizations from 1977 and also all outpatient treatments from 1995 and onwards. And this is literally all treatments. So even if it's a private hospital, you're still going to get reimbursed partly by the state. So you're still registering that, that uh, identification number. And we use the hospitalization data to get a measure of health where we're going to be using a Charleston comorbidity score, which is an indication of having at least one condition that is linked to increased risk of mortality within the next 10 year period. So to give you an overview of kind of our data in a in the um, the, the, the way we want to work with this moving forward with a US uh, Denmark comparison. So in Denmark, we're basically covering generations born from 1912 to 2018, to, uh, to 2018, which actually links up quite nicely with what's covered within the PSID. And that's going to be our initial kind of point of, of comparison. And then the plan is to try to tailor the Danish data into looking basically like the data structure of the Wisconsin and the total of studies later on. To, ma to make a comparison of a kind of most similar US state to, to what Denmark is. I mean, Wisconsin is basically Germans and Swedes, and Denmark is right, right, between Denmark, uh, right between Germany and Sweden. So we're trying to mimic that population structure the best we can. So we'll go into some, some data. Um, here I've just pulled life expectancy at birth in Denmark from 1901 until 2020 from Statistic Denmark's uh, Website. So this, if anyone wants to pull these numbers, they are publicly available. And like most of other rest of the uh, industrialized world, Denmark saw a massive increase in life expectancy throughout the 20th century and moving forward also into the 21st. And it's kind of happening in two in two parts. First, until around the late 1950s, start 1960s, you have this kind of first demographic transition style. Increase in life expectancy, mainly driven by declining uh, infant and child mortality. And then moving into the 60s, the increase you start seeing from there is more driven by increased life expectancy at older age. Throughout the, especially from the 60s and forward, we're also seeing an increase in maternal age, especially maternal age at, at first birth. This is happening at the same time as we're seeing a, a contraction in in the total cohort fertility across time. So back in, in, the, in 1960, these women are still having a high number of children, but moving into the 80s, that then drops down to around 1.9 child per, per woman. But over the period from, 60, from 62 to 2020, we are seeing increase average age of first birth from around 23 to roughly 29 and a half and a increase in, in average age at, at all birth from around 26 and a half up until 21 and a half now. That's 31 and a half now. 
But we're going to be zooming in on 1990 until 2020 because that's where we get our good data coverage. And another quite drastic thing happens in this period, and this is changing the education of mothers. So in 1990, almost half of all mothers who gave birth that year had less than high school as their highest level of education. But at the end of the period, it's around 22%. Whereas the share that had any college or university, so that's all, third, all tertiary, tertiary degrees, increased from around 18% to now being almost half of, of all mothers. So a drastic change in the composition of who becomes mothers during this period. At the same time, as we know, education uh, delays birth. So we're also seeing very different age at birth across education. So for example, in, in 2018, which is the last year we have in the data at the moment, if you had less than high school, you would, you would on average be 27 and a half when you had a child, while if you had any college education, you would be above 32 two years of age on average when you had a child. So we're seeing compositional changes in education, and this is of course tied into the late birth. So what does this mean for whether or not children get a grandparent? And for now, we're gonna be focusing on maternal grandparents, just so I don't throw too many figures at you. But this figure tells you the proportion of grandparents maternal grandparents that are alive when a grandchild is born. So generally, the main takeaway, first of all, is everyone more or less gets a grandmother, or at least between 94 to 95% of, of the sample gets a grandmother at birth. Whereas for grandfathers, there is a slight decrease in, in the early to mid 90s, where we did see a, a, a rather rather hefty increase in, uh, in maternal age at birth, but then that goes into a, a decrease, then, then that goes into an increase from the mid nineties, in other words. So at the end of the data period, nine out of 10 kids also get a maternal grandfather. But how long do they get them for? So here we are giving you the life expectancy for the grandparents. And this is just calculated using very standard kind of life table style estimates um, at birth. And we're seeing, again, start the period, people could expect to have a grandfather for maybe 17 years, whereas they can expect to have a grandmother for a bit more than 25. At the end of that period, 2018, grandmother hasn't really moved very much. She dipped a little bit throughout the years, but it's back around a bit more than 25. And grandfathers have slightly increased to around 19 and a half years of, uh, of shared lifetime with, uh, with the grandchild. But under masking this is first of all, that grandparents are getting older because mothers are getting older. So in 1990, uh, your, if your grandmother was alive when you were born, she was a bit less than 55. Uh, while in 2018, she has, she's a bit more than 48, uh, 58. So they are getting increasingly older. And for, uh, for grandfathers, if they were alive, they were 57 years old in, uh, in 1990 and around 61 in 2018. So grandparents are getting older. And as you also see, if we, if we not only look at the alive grandparents, but also all grandparents that the blue and the green line, then they're even old, even, they would be even older. So there is, of course, not surprisingly a negative age effect playing out here. If we further break down who gets a grandparent at birth um, by, by mother's education, we're also seeing some different patterns and also again across grandparental gender. So at the start of the period, if you had a university degree as a mother, you were much less likely to have your father be alive when you became a mother than if you only had less than high school or high school education, but that is actually changing over time. So now mothers with the college education and mothers that have less than high school are the ones that are most likely to get to have a grandfather alive when their child is born. Whereas women that only has high, that has high school 
are, are losing, are starting to lose out a little bit. And there's no confidence intervals, and I know this, this by the way, because we are looking at, at full populations. So I don't want to mess up the data anymore than I have to. If we look at how long you can expect to have your grandparent, we're actually seeing something slightly different. Uh, generally, if you're a college educator, you can expect that your parents are going to be around to play with your, with your child for less time than if you have high school and even less, and even less time than if you only have, a, um, have less than high school education. So while there's still, there seems to be a tightening of forgetting a grandparents, there's still a clear difference across education, educations in how long people are getting a grandparent for. Um, but what we really want to do in this paper is kind of try to disentangle the impact of this fertility delay uh, and the life expectancy increase. So how much of your chance of getting a grandparent when you're born is caused by changes over time in, in their grandparents' life expectancy, and how much of it is caused by fertility delay of both your grandmother, but also your mother. And another way of thinking about this is basically saying this is, some of this is an age effect, the age at birth for two generations, and some of this is a cohort effect, the life expectancy for grandparents born in a given year. So, if we can actually think this into an AP, APC style setup. So the age effect is the fertility timing combined with two generations. Uh, life expectancy is a cohort effect of, um, of the grandparent's birth cohort. And then there's also gonna be a period effect because otherwise we don't have an APC. Uh, and the period effect is gonna be selection into fertility. So that is gonna be basically our education story here. How does, the educational composition of who's having children over time change. And as most of you know, an APC problem present, presents a linear and mean problem, or as someone who's trained in econometrics, it's, we, don't, we can't estimate it with a full rank in, a, in an OLS model. But what we can do is use some of the recent work done by Ethan Foss and Chris Winchair on bounding effects. So they have a couple of papers, one of them is in demography, there's one in sociological science, and there's an annual review of sociology paper that all discuss this way of addressing um, APC issues, where you instead of trying to, uh, instead of only estimating two of the components, you instead try to bound the effect by imposing some theoretical restrictions on them. And we're gonna be imposing some rather simple theoretical restrictions. We're gonna first of all say, this is just, I'm not going to go into detail with this too much. This is from this is just basically reproducing some of the figures from their paper. But we're going to uh, we're going to impose two restrictions on the data. We're going to say that there's a negative age effect on your probability of having a grandparent when you're born. So the older the grandparent would be at your birth, the less likely he or she is to be alive. And that is con that's going to continue over time. I think we can all agree on on, on that being a rather reasonable assumption about how human life course evolves with some caveats about the pandemic, but we don't have 20, uh, 20, 2020 data yet, so we don't have that headache yet. Then we're also gonna impose the restriction that life expectancy is increasing over time. So later born cohorts are gonna live longer due to better diet, better medical, better access to medical care and so on. So that means that all else equal, if your grandparent is born at a, into a later cohort, they are more likely to be there when you're born than if they were born into an earlier cohort. And having all these, having these two things, these two restrictions allow us to kind of have a bounded space of what the age effect, the period effect, and the cohort effect can be. And basically what we're doing from this is then we're decomposing the changes over time in your probability of having a grandparent into what is contributed by a cohort effect, what is contributed by an age effect, and what's contributed by a period effect. And we're doing this at three different places of this, this solution space and bounded space we get. We're doing it at, at the scenario where there's no age effects in the data, so age effects equal zero. We're doing a scenario where there's no cohort effect, so there's no life expectancy increase across cohorts. And then we're doing it as what is probably more uh, closer to the correct solution, 
in the middle of that of that space. And when we look at the kind of the middle of, of the space and look at these changes over time, so what we're seeing what's really what's predominantly driving changes, or actually in our case, more or less the, the fact that it's rather constant the share who gets a grandmother is mainly driven by increasing cohort effects. So it is driven predominantly by life expectancy, but then negatively ne negatively affected by period effects. That's your selection into um, fertility. And that's, I'm gonna show in a moment, it's basically gonna be our education story because we are shifting education. More mothers are on average becoming higher educators that's pushing them, um, that's pushing different groups into having children that is going to give us this slightly negative uh, period effect. We can then look at the scenario where we're saying that there's no age effect. So your, your grandparents age is not going to affect whether or not they are alive when, when you're born. In that case, we're just seeing much larger cohort effects, much larger period effects. Then we can go the other way and say there's no life expectancy increase over the periods we're studying. So cohort effects going to be zero. And that's in, in that case, we're seeing a slightly positive period effect, but still a negative, but a negative and still rather small age effect. So the main takeaway from this is actually that what seems to be driving this, at least under most of the possible space that these three effects can play out, is that life expectancy is increasing your, your likelihood of having a grandparent when you're born, but selection into education. Is is what's pulling it down. That's listening into into fertility is what pulling it pulling it down. And this is is this negative period effect that we're going to argue is going to be driven by uh, by changing changing education because when education changes, what happens is people become educationally mobile. You're going to have a grandmother that's going to be the that's the uh, the x axis. On this graph, the the expat, like the the vertical, the vertical panels on this is grandmother's education, and the horizontal panels on this is mother's education. So if you look at the up the upper left corner, you're seeing a mother with less than high school and a grandmother less than high school, and the probability that that grandmother is alive when this child when her child is born, that's going to be the black line, and the probability that that grandmother is healthy. So that's going to be having a child's and comorbidity score of zero when her grandchild is born. And not only that this, both these slightly decrease over time, but also this can maybe be a little bit hard to see, but if that mother becomes upward educationally mobile, so we're moving down in the left column, she, it becomes less and less likely that that child is going to get a grandmother. So if you have a mother who has less than high school, and you end up with a university degree, your grandchild has the lowest probability of getting a grandmother. And this has increased over the period you study. And not only does this child have the lowest probability, they also have the lowest likelihood of him, if, even if it gets a grandmother, of that grandmother being healthy. So we've been thinking, at, at, we've been thinking about this very much as kind of a perverse effect of upward educational mobility. So I'm very much trained as a with a background in, in, in kind of IB, IPM sociology. So we're thinking a lot about educational mobility as being a positive thing. But here we're actually seeing a situation where being upwardly mobile does mean that you, at least for a generation, loses out to some extent on education, on the generational overlap. And if we did this with uh, maternal grandfathers, instead, this would be even more clear. If we did it with paternal grandfathers, it would be clearest because those are the ones that tend to people tend to have least of uh, and who tend to be the most unhealthy because they're on average are the oldest. So the next step on this project is to try to estimate years and fraction of shared lifetime for both grandchild and grandparents' perspectives, and then um, go even deeper into this case of uh, intergenerational economic, uh, intergenerational socioeconomic mobility by looking at these shorter lifetimes that grandchildren get with their grandparents, go a little bit deeper into the health data as well, also looking at how much sicker are these grandparents and also look at geographical overlap. So are they living closer or farther from each other? 
And last, of course, is to add the, uh, the PSID US component. So this is basically reproducing all these figures to the extent we can on the, uh, the PSID data. So, Marcy, will you close us out or? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, so, yeah, so there's a lot of challenges um, in this work, right? So, um, Peter is a master at these uh, Danish data, which have been really fun. But when you think about it, a lot of things are changing over a very long period of time, right? And so we're sort of looking at some of these basic indicators, but, you know, capturing a lot of broad change in the period, fertility, of course, life expectancy, educational composition, and then the association between education and all of these demographic factors, right? So this is kind of a simplistic heuristic of kind of what's happening at a very big picture level. And there's a lot more I think we can do and think about. Um, also, it's, it's quite tricky in my experience to conduct a useful cross-national comparison, right? Because you have these two countries, you have reasons why, you know, I made the case that there's demographic similarity, but there's quite a bit of difference in policies and inequality that doesn't come out of nowhere, right? You have a lot of underlying differences of kind of values, history, culture, and so forth. And so what's the best way to make this comparison uh, meaningful um, for, for, for research and for broader implications? Um, and then when we think about kind of what all of this means, I think we come back to the importance of, you know, linked lives of, you know, being alive at the same time is really one of the most fundamental um, aspects of human life, right, of sharing, um, you know, a time with someone in terms of interactions, relationships, um, investments, um, transfers of time and money, right, who are you kind of around to interact with, and what does that mean for how you think of yourself, how the roles you play, how you're part of a broader kinship network. And so we, we think this is something that's um, kind of intrinsic to demography, but I think um, it's been a bit under um, appreciated in terms of how this generation length, and then therefore the overlap across generations, how that affects a lot of different things. And so we're um, continuing to look at this and going to think a bit more about kind of what all this means, and we look really forward to your uh, comments and uh, questions so um so thanks for thanks for listening being here and we open up to to reactions and comments and questions marcy peter thank you so much uh, just phenomenally incredible data and the story that you put together was was super interesting and and uh and important so uh can I, let me just take the prerogative of, of asking the first one. So I guess I'm gonna, um, from the perspective of a bit of a wish list here, as you were talking, I was thinking about uh, space as well. You know, another, another component kind of where are these grandparents and where are these grandkids and how that may vary by education um, too. So not only that, so not only thinking about the Time, the overlapping time spent with one another, which is a super interesting story in and of itself. But can you spec? Do you have data, at least in the Danish context, on on kind of the where these grandkids and grandparents live, and how that differs by education, and and how you may be able to enrich the story that way as well? Yes, so, Peter, you want to go ahead? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll I'll jump on that one. So. What was important to remember is Denmark is a very small country, so no one is more than four hours apart. Uh, that being said, the uh, the average Dane lives roughly six miles from where they're born. But that changes a lot with education. For example, I so I have a PhD and I live, I'm not great at miles, I live 1600 kilometers away from where I'm born. Uh, so there is definitely an educational gradient, and especially I think once we start considering mobility, uh, educational mobility in this, uh, we have we have started to to look a little bit at it. I have a an RA sitting in Copenhagen that's basically coding travel times between all Danish municipalities, uh, so we can start looking at it that way. But the general sense so far from the data is basically you're seeing the the similar pattern where the the more educated you are. The, the farther away you live from your, you, you got, your child is going to be living from their grandparents. And again, with the same kind of cost of mobility attached to it as well. Also because effectively it's a country where mo where all of the universities are located within four, four uh, cities. 
So it just creates this very kind of, even for a small, a small place, it's very densely urbanized areas, for especially people with, with longer educations. And just to follow on that, we hope to look at it in the US context as well, right? A much bigger country and using the PSAD and other data sources, I think we can get that. And I think it's interesting because, um, you know, less educated or lower SES people tend to live more proximate to their families. Um, and yet, obviously, when you have higher resources, you're able to um, travel or even have a second home. I live in, you know, Madison, Wisconsin, and a non-trivial number of my colleagues have grandparents of their children who have either bought a home here or come frequently. Um, and so the, you know, the ability to travel, I think, makes a huge difference. And so then you start thinking about, okay, what's the quality of time and the quality of interaction, right? If the parents are retired and have money and can come and just have kind of fun with the kids versus maybe the grandparents live right nearby and maybe they're providing childcare, but they might also be working if they're younger, maybe they're not in as good of a, you know, health and so forth. And so I think there's a lot of, I think Bob, it's a really good point and something we will think hopefully more about and be able to measure um, for sure in the Danish context. And I think we can do some in the, in the US as well. So, so thanks for that. So I see both Jessica, Sue and Alexis Dennis have questions. I'll just let y'all take it away. Hi, I don't know which of us was first. Sorry. I think you were first. Okay, all right. Thank you so much, Marcy and Peter. This is such an interesting study. And one thing that really struck me was that um, finding you had about social mobility, about how women who were upwardly mobile for um, their education had children who were less likely to have grandparents and less likely to have healthy grandparents. And I was wondering if you can unpack the story a little bit more, like building off of this comment that you just had, Marcy, about the quality of time that the kids are spending with their grandparents. Um, I was wondering if you can get into some more detail about the percentage of time that the grandparents are healthy. And I was wondering if also this is kind of like that sandwich generation story where for some groups, you're going to see the presence of grandparents like really enriching and lovely. And then for some groups, it's going to be source of um, resource strain because people are taking care of both their parents and their children simultaneously. So I don't know if you can get at that or if you have thoughts on unpacking that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this, I, um, this educational mobility piece was Peter's awesome idea. So Peter, do you want to take the first crack at that? Sure, sure, sure. No, I think like one of the things we have been talking about doing, but haven't had the time to get around to it yet, is, is basically also start by looking at, at healthy life expectancy. So instead of how many, how many years do you get, how many years can you on average expect to have a healthy grandparent? And from Danish data, we can do this using these like old school child and mobility scores. And in the US data, there is some stuff in PSID where we can also at least generate a pretty good measure of, of whether or not you're having a, a healthy life or, or not. And in terms of, of time, as we already talked about, there is, there is of course, geographical proximity, but I also happen to be the curator of the Danish time use uh, survey so one of the things we might do downstream is trying to look into that as well. Look, looking, we have data there from 1987 until the most recent collection was uh, was during the pandemic, um, and see how older people are also spending time with with their grandchildren there, and look at how these. I mean, of course, it's going to be a much much smaller sample, but looking at some, if we can see some of the same patterns playing out of, of this kind of, yeah, I'm, I'm still very fond of calling it perverse effect of, of upward mobility. Um. Yeah, and Jessica, thank you. You raise a really good point, right? And sort of thinking about, um, you know, being alive is one thing, right? But is it, as you said, kind of a drain, right? You're caring for a sick grandparent who's not, you know, doing fun things with the kids at all, but instead needing support or needing help, or maybe they're in another, you know, facility and needing something. So being alive is like one thing we realize it doesn't necessarily mean lots of investments are coming down from G1 to G3. And I think some of the work in this area, some of the multi-generational studies have started to get at this, right? Of like, if, if people are living together, who's the guest and who's, you know, the host? 
and what to, what what motivated this living together, right? Was it the need of the grandparent or was it the grandparents providing support to the parents and kids? And so I think, at least in the Danish context, as Peter uh, indicated, right, you know everything about everyone, <laughs> something that would never quite fly, I think, in the United States. And so it's kind of an amazing rich data source. And I think we'll be able to do some of that in the US um, as well. But in, in Denmark, you can really know about people's health, what they're being treated for, what their medical condition is, and you can get some really good sense on their healthiness or lack thereof. And in the US, I think we can, you know, do some things as well. And I think the intersection that I'm thinking about the distance, where they live, you know, are they healthy? Are they in a good place? Um, into this trade-off, perhaps, of um, you know, time versus resources versus health. I think will be will be something to think about. So yeah, thanks for that common question. Alexis was next. I think. Yeah. Thank you so much for a really interesting um, project, really interesting work. And with the caveat that um, I don't know much about the Denmark context. One thing that I was thinking about as you were setting up your project was how um, in terms of like life expectancy, what families look like um, or cultural norms in terms of like, for example, I grew up in a multi-generational household. Um, some of those things can look very different by race in the U.S. And so I was wondering if down the line um, or now, um, if you can kind of extrapolate or generalize or have thought about how some of the processes you're studying might look different in black families versus white families in the US or maybe like immigrant populations or families versus um, white and more privileged families in, in Denmark. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 great question. Um, I'll, I'll ask maybe uh, respond first on the US side. So that's definitely a huge piece of what, what we want to do once we get the US data up and running, right? There's, um, you know, there's growing evidence obviously on um, differences by race, ethnicity, immigration status, and family life, how, how families play out, how they interact. And so that's going to be a key piece of what we're trying to do. It's harder to do that on the comparative side because, um, well, Peter can talk about the Denmark Danish context, but it's, it's not quite the same, right, in terms of race, ethnicity. So it's a definitely a big piece of what we want to do in the U.S. and, um, you know, teasing out some of the subgroup differences and how that might play out, because I'm sure that they're there. But Peter, I don't know what you want to say about the Danish context. Oh, yeah. So even though we also have a very, a very long uh, colonial history, that colonial history has mainly taken place at other sites than, than Denmark. So we are very, very uh, homogenous population until somewhere in the 70s, where we start seeing, seeing groups of immigrants coming up, first from Turkey, and later on from, from Palestine, and then from East Africa, and, and Afghanistan, Libya, and Syria, and so on, but they simply haven't been here long enough for us to get that link, even if some of them do come up as whole families, but but it's not real, it's something we can revisit probably in 20 years. Uh, but until then, because we are we need that second generation to be born in country, we are kind of stuck with with mainly looking at, at, at people that more or less look like me. Um, and, but then what we do have is this, we are historically, our educational expansion happens later than the US educational expansion. So we do have some very different educational patterns playing out time-wise than we do in the, in the US context, which is one of the things we're kind of hoping to leverage in, uh, in the comparison. Thank you so much. Do we have time for one more question if anybody wants to sneak one in quickly or? Young, young side, uh, and, then, and that'll, that'll be it. Okay, I have a, a very simple factor question. There's an interesting parallel because recently I'm teaching a uh, demography class checking the progress of mortality between the US and uh, Denmark. And mm -hmm. interesting, uh, as you show in your graph, that there was a significant slowdown after hitting uh, life expectancy at 70. And similar thing happened in the United States. Most other countries continue you know, the, the progress. So do you have any insight? Um, it's, I mean, so we did, we, we, we tend to talk about Scandinavia now as this kind of beacon of, of uh, welfare state and so on and so on. Bernie Sanders kept referring to us through his um, presidential campaign, but we started quite late. So 
So I think we have a very rapid increase in the first early part, partly because we start late. We have actually had pretty high infant mortality for quite a while. Um, and then Denmark is kind of the, of the Nordic countries and other countries that drink and smoke a lot. So we actually haven't seen the same life expectancy increases as Sweden and Norway has. Um, but it's still, it's not so life expectancy mortality is something that I'm actually quite new to. We mainly, the place I work, we mainly get, uh, get Jim Bopel and, and his crew to, uh, to do that kind of work for us. Uh, so I'm still, I'm we're still kind of unpacking that a bit, but I think Jim would probably be the guy to, to ask more serious questions about it. Thank you. I will send you the graph because it's quite unique. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That'd be great. Marcy, Peter, thank you so much for a fascinating talk, um, for wonderful data, for something, you know, uh, just these data on grandparents, grandchildren that we just don't see very often. And uh, so by education, this is really, really fun. Um, so really appreciate you both spending time with us today um, for giving such a great talk and look forward to seeing you all soon, seeing this in print and seeing more of this. This is fascinating work. So thank you all for coming today and we'll see you all next week. And Peter, Marcy, thank you. Thanks so much, Bob. Really a treat thank to be here. Us. So thanks all. And if anyone has comments or questions, feel free to shoot us an email. If you want to engage in this work, we'd love to have you come along and join us. So um, thank you, really appreciate it.